Why, hello there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show with me, your host, Agostino Zinger, and this is episode number 370. That's 370. How you doing? How you feeling? Great. Amazing. How am I? Same old, you know, trucking on in, trying to keep my head down and just doing the Lord's work, whatever that may be. If it's your first time tuning into the show, please make sure you smash that like button, hit the comment down below, and also make sure you subscribe. And if you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. And if you want to support the show via Patreon, the link is down below too in the pinned comments. Um, if you subscribe via Patreon, you also get access to my entire audio library of over 300 podcast episodes as well as this podcast episode in full audio format before it comes out on any other platform so before it comes out on spotify or apple and all that malarkey and even streams on youtube you'll find it first on patreon so make sure you back it on patreon for as little as one dollar per month you can get access to my entire library what are you waiting for Ugh, we're back yeah we're back we're back i'm back not we are right i always hear hearing people have a little thing they're doing and they're like oh we 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 like you're running some big media conglomerate right no need for that i am back but i'm glad that you could join me so um what's been going on not much really in it i think we've um for the most part <laughs> if you're if you're in the uk you'll know that your year is officially done for in it government have announced announced some new changes in terms of gatherings during covid so 2020 is officially done so but i think most people had come to that realization anyway i think if you're one of the you know small minority of people out there that are still holding out that you could you know go out for halloween or you could have christmas so it's a wrap it's all done just look forward to new year new year's new year new me <laughs> new year new all of us actually new world <laughs> Oh, absolutely mad, man. But yeah, apart from that, not much. England game against Iceland was absolute snooze. No, sorry, against Denmark. Absolute snooze fest. You get the impression that Southgate is probably going to be out of a job very soon, considering the level of talent that's available, considering the fact that most of the players are, you know, extremely young. They've got really big social media presence. Um, You know, sponsors coming out of their asses. They're not going to allow this guy that wears you know what waistcoats and stuff to jeopardize the ability for these sponsors to make money you know via the sporting excellences or sporting achievements of the england team so for sure he's definitely going to get pushed out i can see it happening but as a manager anyway tactically he doesn't really seem the most adventurous he doesn't necessarily have um the best way of kind of utilizing or getting the most out of england because it's always a conundrum in an england national team it's always weird unlike any other national team I feel like we're always stuck in two camps. It's either we get a coach that picks the best players, right? The best English born or English, um, you know, uh, the best players you can pick for England, right? He just picks them who's playing at the moment. Or you have a solution where you pick the best players for the positions, whether or not they're the best ones in their position or not. So then you avoid that Gerard and Lampard thing that happened back in the day, right? Gerard Lampard and scores because they were, you know, start arguably two of the three of the standout um, English midfielders in the Premier League. English managers would have to try and f- shoehorn them or to fit them in a team. But sometimes, you know, it might be beneficial to actually play a Gerard with a Carrick or a Gerard with a Lampard or a Parker with a Scholes. Regardless of the combination, sometimes it's less about the individual skill sets of each person and it's more about how they complement each other. <clears throat> Similar to like a really good um, centre back partnership, right? You need two players that actually complement each other as opposed to two of the exact same player. And I feel like England are sort of like stuck within the camp of like, you know, let's just pick our best players and hope it works out. And unfortunately, it doesn't necessarily, especially the, the, it seems like the better, the better team you play, the more that kind of strategy can be found wanting i think you could probably get away with just picking your best players i think brazil do that quite often if they just have they just pick the best brazilian players available for selection they're usually going to beat most most teams but then the moment you face a team that's you know the upper echelons especially a team that has a uh a very um you know a very clever coach you're definitely going to come wanting so i wonder what they're going to do going forward the england team i really do wonder but hey that's a story for another day but yeah we've got jam pack show for you today jam pack show loads of stuff to get through spanning a whole bevy of topics from stuff happening with joe budden stuff happening 
um, in the DJ world. We've got other things about people doing blackface. We've got some mad, mad topics to talk about. Really mad, mad stuff. So make sure you got a drink or something to snack on whilst we get in involved. In case you're wondering, I've got myself a little tea in it, you know, just trying to just trying to be the best version of myself, really, during these hard times. So first things first, get this out of the way. Let's um, congratulate man like troops from AFTV on his um, big move. He announced earlier on today that he's leaving. AFTV and if you're not familiar Troops is one of the um, stand-up personalities on Arsenal Fan TV a YouTube channel specifically for Arsenal fans you know all that good um, fan channel talk that you know and love he's one of the kind of breakout stars of that channel but he's surprisingly announced because I don't know the guy but I didn't know he was this was in the works but he's been tapped up by Barstool and he's moving over to New York to essentially lead, I guess, the push for more soccer coverage on Barstool Sports, which is amazing. And I guess a life-changing opportunity for him, right? Taking his entire family over to America to get started over there and do his own thing. And he's also mentioned on the video that he's also going to have the opportunity to start his own podcast and give that a bit of a push, especially under the Barstool's umbrella. If you're familiar with Barstool Sports, which I am, you'll know that, you know, they do a really good job in kind of providing the platform for the individual podcast to kind of grow. They've got a really amazing machine in there that sort of works to kind of, you know, as long as you've got the content, they're going to push it out there and give you the best possible platform to kind of reach a wider audience. And I'm assuming with the MLS really improving over the last few seasons, it feels like the MLS has really stepped up a level. There's a lot of younger players in the MLS coming through, playing for different national teams, such as Germany. I think there's one Italian kid as well playing in the MLS. There's a few kids that are kind of going out there in terms of kind of getting a bit of experience playing first team football. And just the standard overall is, is improving. So I'm sure there's been a concentrated effort to try and kind of diversify their out their kind of coverage on Barstool, right, which is kind of the quintessential American sports, right? You've got, and, and I think hockey, American football, basketball, baseball, um, you want to kind of expand it a little bit. And of course, you know, soccer being a sleeping giant a bit in America, it seems like a great move for everybody involved. And again, it just speaks to the value of fan channels and to the value of these kind of DIY creators online, that are essentially rewriting the football narrative in the UK because unfortunately, unlike America, the football coverage in the UK is very much, um, uh, it's very middle class, it's very white, it's very stiff, it's very safe, and it's lacking in any kind of entertainment value, right? We don't really have a, a skip and Shannon show, right? We don't really have a Stephen A. Smith character. If we do, it's just some Muppet on TalkSport, right? Rattling up everybody, telling you, you know, that supposedly, you know, if Paul Pogba dyes his hair a certain colour, that means he's not taking training seriously, right? You've got absolute Muppets running that show. So it's good to see that, you know, especially when this when this guys from ends and that are just like decided, hey, I'm want I want to kind of represent my team. I don't feel as if my team is being represented well in the media, and I want to give my opinion in it because I think over the period of time, because there was a, I did think there was a period of time where a lot of these kind of football um, fan channel guys kind of felt a little bit inadequate. They kind of felt as if like, oh yeah, if you when you come across or when you're standing across or sitting across from or talking to like a former pro who kind of tries to big time you and give you the former pro talk and, you know, kind of make it seem like you don't know what you're talking about because you haven't played the game. But then the more you start talking to former pros, especially at the higher level, you realise they don't really know what they're talking about when it comes to football, especially, you know, because for the most part, if you've got the natural ability to play for some of the bigger clubs in the UK, you don't really think about your game that much. You don't really articulate what kind of goes into making you play that way or why your team performed that way because you're just used to playing with the best talent in the world. But you go down lower in the leagues, you talk to the guys in League One, guys in League Two, the guys playing in conference, you start to see, okay, these are the people that actually really understand football because what ends up happening is that you end up bumping into people that actually love the game of football and aren't just in it for the money. They're not just in it for the, you know, because they've got nothing else to do, which is what you think, which is the impression I get from a lot of people on Sky Sports. They just don't have anything else to do, right? They're middle-aged white men who have essentially spent most of their lives playing football, right? Um, being absent from their families, uh, drinking themselves silly. So the last thing they want to do doing is being at home with their wife and children hanging out. They want to just kind of constantly be around football. So you go up to Sky Sports, you film eight-hour segments, you rant and rave about somebody's sh color of boots um, as if that's kind of good, you know, analysis. And then you go home and you just keep collecting your checks. So it's good to see these guys kind of disrupting things a little bit. 
And um, yeah, I'm happy for troops, man. Well, well done for him. I think again, it just goes to show, you know, if you um, if you kind of represent yourself in the truest way possible on this platform, um, there are kind of opportunities that will open themselves up to you because I think there is a there can be a tendency maybe to get a bit you know to kind of conform one way or the other. But I do think, especially if you're, you know, if you've got a sports channel or whatever it may be on, on YouTube, whatever you're doing, you do owe it to yourself to kind of be to sort of like speak your truth because like your lump it you'd rather kind of build a fan base based upon something that you actually think you know based on your actual real beliefs and not on just some caricature you're trying to play um that's why i think that kind of sky sports match of day punditry will never work on on youtube because it's not the realness right people want to hear the realness so when these guys give people the realness and fans kind of flock to them because this is what you, you're you talking about with your friends on a group chat in barber shops on the street corner wherever you may be it's no surprise that these media companies will see what's going on there they see the traction they see the engagement um and they're like you know what let's give this guy a push let's get let's let's take him to the next level and then, you know, and here we are, man. So big up troops and hopefully we see more of what he's doing when he gets over there in the States. But that's a flipping great opportunity. And again, like, you have to kind of, you know, when those opportunities come your way, you have to kind of take advantage of them, regardless of what may transpire later on down the line. I think just having this opportunity in the first place is a win in itself. So yeah, big up that guy. What else has happened? Uh... Oh, um... These just well, not leaks. Well, then let's actually go to this. This is more interesting news. So, I guess I mentioned it earlier before, or maybe in the previous show. But essentially, um, twenty twenty is cancelled. I think for the entire or for where I am in the UK. I'm not sure where you are, but um, at least for us, it's completely cancelled. I'm a, I'm alright with it. I think I came to a resolution or realization of a, a few months ago. Because I guess I mentioned it prior, but my analogy that I always use is like, I feel as soon as the government got involved and sort of like lock stuff down and tell people, tell businesses to close and all this sort of stuff, I kind of, I kind of likened it to when you're at a really banging house party and then the police get called because of noise complaints and then that immediately shuts the rave off and immediately causes certain people to leave. It kind of ruins the mood. It dampens them in for a certain part. And even if you restart the rave again, it's never the same as it was prior. Um, it's not like one of those scenes out in the movie where like, it's like, you know, they pull the cord out, the generator runs out and then you plug it back in again, it just pops off. It's not like that. Usually the longer a period of silence happens, especially with police around there, usually parties suffer and you can't really start it up. So I think my analogy was that the government were essentially the police and they had no plan of how to restart things. They had no plan of how to kind of reopen the economy in a safe way. They had no plan of how to kind of safeguard businesses, um, how to alleviate the fears of parents with their children about going back to school, um, you know, give students a peace of mind. They had no plan. There was nothing in play, no constituencies. If anything, it's been, again, local grassroots organizations that have been really doing the hard work in terms of making sure everyone uh, has the necessary information to make the necessary adjustments in what they're doing in their life so did no part of me thought we were going to suddenly get back to normal no part of me believed this whole push to get people to have their summer holidays save your summer all this sort of stuff it was all it was all garbage if anything it was just maybe you know i would allege it might have been a process it might have been an issue of like our government and like you know governments of countries that we still kind of have links to being cahoots with their tourism or tourism departments and then trying to work out a deal so that they can increase tourism in those countries whatever it may be but it, whatever it was it wasn't sincere so now we've got more news recently that we've got some other restrictions on the social gatherings in the UK that are going to further restrict people's movement. And if anything, put a final nail in the coffin for anybody that was thinking, oh, I'm going to save my year. Nope, it's completely done. Headline from Sky, Sky News says coronavirus social gatherings of more than six people to be banned in England from Monday. It says a big um, a ban on groups of more than six uh, people gathering in homes, parks and pubs and restaurants in England <clears throat> is being imposed by Boris Johnson. The biggest coronavirus crackdown since lockdown rules were eased. First offenders will be fined hundred pounds, which will be which will double on each uh, further repeat offence up to three thousand two hundred. The prime minister will announce in a bid to stem the alarming surge in COVID nineteen cases in the UK. So I guess you know this sounds like the police maybe had a role into this because I did always wonder like how were they enforcing these sort of things? 
because it it kind of did get you know especially from the leadership from the top it kind of felt like all the precautions that we had concerning covid were just suggestions they weren't rules they weren't enforced in any kind of way now of course that might impede on your rights whatever let's put that to one side but i was wondering like legal 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 wise right in terms of legalities and in terms of just you know getting stuff done how would you enforce such a rule so i'm assuming this is the best way to get around it right you kind of strip down you strip it down to its bare necessities. You're like, hey, no more than six people. If you're outside, you get fined 100 pounds. So it kind of lays it um, bare there. It says, it continues. It says, um, we need to act now to stop the virus spreading. Ms. Johnson will declare at Downing Street news conference um, with a new advertising campaign that says hands, face, space. Don't know what that means. Um, so we are simply strengthening the rules of social contact, making them easier to understand for the police to enforce. Like I mentioned, the PM will announce it is absolutely critical that people now abide by the rules. And remember the basics, washing the five hands and covering the face. Uh, that's what it sounds like in my head anyway. Uh, keeping space from others and getting a test if you have symptoms. Um, so what are the new rules? From next Monday, any gatherings of one six people in England will be illegal. This applies to gatherings both indoors and outdoors, which means... Most clubs and bars are probably done for the year, then, isn't it? How are they going to reopen the bars and clubs in, in under this um under these new rules? Um, it continues says new rules do not apply to households and bubbles of more than six or gatherings for work or education. Again, trying to get people back into the office, it seems like. Um, weddings, funerals, and organized team sports carried out in COVID secure way are, are also exempt. So I'm assuming there we go. There's money talking, right? The Premier League came in, the sponsors came in and said, hey, we need to have fans in stadiums one way or the other come next season. We can't, you know, we can't allow anything different. So that's interesting to see. It continues, says uh, people will be first fined £100, but this will be doubled further to repeat offences of 3200 But like I said, it's just wild, isn't it? The year's officially over. Like it's done, done. Don't get me wrong. I was I, I, I'm, I, I, you know, I accepted it a while back, but this is in black and white. It's over. Whatever plans you had for the year, they're completely scuppered for the most part. If they, especially they involve some sort of social gathering, which I'm assuming most people are, you know, are probably um longing for. It's absolutely nuts, mate. It's absolutely nuts. Absolutely nuts. And there's no, there's no end in sight, right? We have New Year. Well, we have Halloween coming up very soon, right? I'm not sure where you are, but in the UK, Halloween's a big deal, especially for the average, average everyday, yeah, for the everyday folk. Um, Halloween, Easter, New Year's Eve are kind of some of the big sort of like party, or maybe just the bank holiday weekends, right? They're usually the kind of the big party boozy up events. So I can just imagine people being locked down, just wanting to have a bit of a breather and just kind of let loose and during Halloween, how that's going to roll, especially with these new rules. Like bloody hell, man. I do not envy those guys in that position at all. It's going to be a real, real tough thing to deal and handle in any kind of meaningful way. But hey, this is not my concern. What else is happening in the world? Oh, news actually came up. Kim Kardashian actually announced on Twitter earlier that Keeping Up Kardashians is over. It is over after the next season that they're filming is officially going to come to an end. Um, the big K U was it K U W T K right? It's completely over, and I'd never thought I'd see the day personally. To be honest, um, I never watched the show. Um, obviously, you know, if you're in the world, you know that the show exists. You might have seen clips here and there, probably the viral, um, you know, images of Kim Kim Kardashian crying and all sorts of other nonsenses, but. I never really was a fan of the show personally, never something I'm actually going to sit there and watch, but I did appreciate the fact that they were able to kind of build an entire empire for themselves, the Kardashians or Jenners, solely of being completely themselves, especially in a world where you felt as if like when you get on TV, you kind of have to pretend or play up a certain parts of, not play up, but you know, maybe try and intellectualize yourself in some kind of way, right? Maybe try and add a dimension to yourself that doesn't actually exist. But I think maybe keeping up with the Kardashians maybe gave birth to things like Jersey Shore is a maybe good example, right? One of the last kind of great reality TV shows in that regard where the, the people that came on that show were exactly who they say they were, right? They were exactly what they said in the tin. And I think that's what I kind of appreciate about the Kardashians and the Jenner's family from afar, that they were just, you know, able to be themselves un unabashedly. Um, obviously, they had their fair share of scandals, but I think in general, 
they've kind of provided a blueprint for a lot of these kind of quote unquote public figures out there in it doing their thing I, I don't think I think you know people won't necessarily give them their flowers because of course they have their gripes with the family you know probably some uh more justifiable than the others but they really did pave the way for a lot of these um influencers influencers out there regardless of what they're doing and and I also like the idea that they're quite family orientated right they're you know they're a bit they're a bit um sycophantic with this kind of desire to have you know to get married and have pop out kids and and just stick with the person regardless of what's happening right it's it gets a little bit uncomfortable but i do like the fact that they're just one big happy family you know on paper of course from the outside looking in don't get me wrong so this is the statement here it says to our amazing fans it is with heavy hearts that we've made a difficult decision as a family to say goodbye to keep our conditions um after what will be 14 years and 20 seasons god damn it hundreds of episodes and numbers and numerous sorry, spin-off shows we are beyond grateful to all of you who've watched us for all these years through the good times the bad times the happiness the tears the many relationships and children will forever <laughs> cherish the wonderful memories and countless people we've met along the way um a part of me thinks the breaking point might have been remember the picture of Kim and Kanye that the paparazzi talk with that they shouldn't have taken when they're kind of like Kim's looks like she's crying in the car after I think um, one of Kanye's you know numerous breakdowns or breakthroughs as he likes to refer to them as I thought that might have been the breaking point right she's a mother of four she's got you know money coming out of her ass she's a legit billionaire um you know you're raising a family the last thing you need is to kind of be plastered all over the tabloids while you're going for a very public disagreement in parenting with your partner do you know what i mean i think that might be one of the breaking points that like she doesn't need it so part of the access i think they got or part of the kind of invasions of privacy has to have come as a consequence of the keep Connection show right like you can't necessarily preach privacy and demand people leave you alone when you've got a show you know on e that's being shown in all countries around the world right in various different languages um that's been running for 20 years and 14 i mean sorry 14 years and 20 seasons it's difficult so i think once you step away from the show i would imagine they'd be in a far better place to demand privacy and also just to kind of step away from the limelight a bit maybe i'm saying that now you know not knowing much about them they might just turn around and say hey guys we've got a brand new show launching on facebook tomorrow but yeah I, I do get the impression they've kind of, you know, they've kind of all had enough um, of, you know, being in front of cameras in that regard anyway. And um, and maybe it was, maybe it's just Kanye too. Maybe Kanye put his foot down. It's like, you know what, enough. Like, I'm going through, I'm going through. Last thing I need are for these film crews to be, you know, um, crawling all over my home, making me feel uncomfortable and all that stuff, innit? You never know. It continues, it says, um, thank you for the thousands of individuals and businesses that have been a part of this experience and the most importantly, a very special thank you to Ryan Seacrest for believing in us, E for being our partner and our production team at Bunim and Murray who spent countless hours documenting our lives. Our last season will air early next year, 2021. Jesus, that's going to be a, a big one to go out in, especially if they put all that drama in there from the past year. Without keeping up with connections, I wouldn't be here where, who I, where I am today. She says, I'm so incredibly grateful to everyone who has watched and supported me and my family these past 14 incredible years. This show made us who we are, and I'll be forever in debt to everyone who played a role in shaping our careers and changing our lives forever. With love and gratitude, Kim. So yeah, fair enough to the minute. It was a good run. I think a lot of people got a lot from it. If you're a fan of this show, I think even haters probably spawned the career off it. I wonder what is Jamila Jamil going to do now? Now that Kardashians are off to off telly, who's she, who's she going to grift off next? It did kind of give a lot of people a career. It probably put a lot of people through college. It paid off a lot of student loans. <laughs> oh my God. But yeah, it's come to an end, unfortunately. And let's see what the next move is. And again, it'll be funny if you know it this is all just a ploy to kind of steer them in the direction for another show or to kind of put the feelers out there for another production company to come along and put in a banging offer but i do get the impression they've kind of all kind of they're kind of all over it in it they're kind of over it i think in general um you know kylie and kendall are young women now both, both grown one's got a kid one's in their mid-20s um, the other sisters are all grown up and doing their own thing. It probably is the right time to kind of, you know, pull the cord on it. And you also, it's, it's best to kind of go on the top. You don't want to kind of be, you know, you don't want people to sort of like culturally cancel you and say, hey, you've kind of run, it's kind of run its course and then just, just kind of tap out. You don't want the dreaded, um, irrelevant, you know, phrase to be uttered when you walk around in places. So 
I definitely get it. I definitely get it on that front. Uh, what else has happened? Um, move on from that one. This is quite interesting, isn't it? Just as an, an observational thing. Um, I guess everyone's familiar what happened with um Jacob Blake in Wisconsin, Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, you know, he's the young gentleman who appeared to have a tussle with the police, um, you know, make his way around the other side of the car, make his way around the driver's side of the door, open it as the police are following him close behind, reach down to get something, and then he got shot in the back seven times. And unfortunately, it seems like he's been paralyzed from the waist down. Maybe it's temporarily, maybe it's something he's going to be able to recover from later on. But for the most part, it does seem like a bit of a shocking incident. But once you sort of like follow the story and read up on what actually happened, you sort of got more details to it and you know as excessive as a force work because i think the argument can be had or the argument should be had anyway that there needs to be a conversation around um how police in america deal with people right in general uh policing doesn't necessarily always have to resort resort in deadly force being used right and of course don't get me wrong some of the videos that get shared online are maybe purposely altered or only recorded from a certain point so you don't get a context of the whole issue you don't get a context of the whole case you don't know exactly what transpired prior to the video recording um you don't know you know anything about the police officer involved he might be a local person that's dealt with this person you know many numerous times you don't know anything you don't know any context you're just seeing a video of a very tense moment being concluded in the most you know brutal way ever by somebody getting shot luckily still alive but jesus you know what i mean it's not like a comfortable thing to go through but this um article popped up in a video of the jacob blake the victim of the shooting giving a message to supporters at hospital bed and it kind of made me feel a bit uneasy because the details of the actual reason why he was at that home in the first place aren't the most um endearing to this whole idea that he suffered from police brutality or that he was unjustly i'm um, not even unjustly the fact that he kind of was like an innocent bystander breaking up a fight and he got shot. That's not really the case, isn't it? But let's continue with the article. It says, Jacob Blake sent a message to support from hospital from BBC News. So Jacob Blake, the black man who was shot seven times while the white police officer in the US state of Wisconsin last month has said that in his constant uh, pain and video uh, posted online. I don't know why they included the race in the title. I don't, uh, sorry, in the article. It's very strange, but hey. Um, we digress it says Mr. Blake who family say may now be paralyzed from the waist down also struck a hopeful note saying that this guy has a lot more life to live the 29 year old was shot in the back as he was re being arrested the incident reignited protests of racism and police brutality in the US some of the protests in Kenosha the city where Mr. Blake was shot turned violent with two people killed an innocent um, an investigation to Mr. Blake's shooting continues meanwhile Mr. Blake appeared on court on Friday pleading not guilty to criminal charges charges filed before the shooting which is the most important thing right supposedly he was involved in some sort of domestic dispute with the mother of his children the mother of his children had uh put out every, had got a restraining order for him because he had so he had assaulted her prior he ends up trespassing getting in a home somehow um sec allegedly sexually ass assaulting the mother of his children she ends up calling the police which what which what kind of which what kind of sparks the inter altercation that we kind of see and then on the other side i see guess we don't see what happens but they try to they try to arrest him they try to kind of you know um yeah they try to arrest him in some way shape or form he resists and then that's what kind of escalates to a shooting and it kind of makes me wonder why they just won't mention that because even with that context the the fact that he got shot seven times in his back is still um unacceptable right there should be a way to police somebody where you don't even allow him the opportunity to get to his door um the do um to to, to get to get to to open the door of his car especially if there's more than one of you right it doesn't make any sense um there should be a way that police officers can tackle and can somehow um you know um hold in place people without having to resort to pulling out guns because that's what it feels like looking from the outside in it looks like from the outside in as a non-american it looks like when i see these encounters the police are unable or they're unwilling to get into a physical altercation which makes sense right the closer you are to somebody the more likely you are to um you know um suffer some kind of uh physical pain or to basically die in that respect right so you kind of have to maintain some level of distance but there needs to be a way 
where they can kind of stop somebody in their tracks without having to pull the gun out. Because in America, it feels like the gun is the only way. When you pull a gun out, you immediately kind of um, elicit a fight or flight response, right? You sort of like get that deer in the headlight sort of thing. And I guess with that and added with the kind of shouting, you know, um, rising the stakes, you know, making stuff really, really anxious, you can get someone to freeze. But there must be another way to do it. It has to be. Whether it's kind of reintroducing stuff like jujitsu or rear naked chokeholds, which I think have been outlawed in most states. There has to be something they need to do because shooting someone in the back seven times isn't isn't the way forward. And like I said, the context still matters. So why can't I just mention the context? Because like I, I mentioned, it's still a bad thing that he got shot. He shouldn't have been shot. You know, it's a domestic dispute you're having. The con that we. Uh, the deals of domestic excuse are, are pretty disgusting, don't get me wrong, but still, that's, that doesn't justify you getting shot seven times. That's insane. Um, what did he actually say? He said, so in a video posted on Twitter by his family lawyer, Mr. Blake still in his hospital bed spoke of the pain he was suffering. He said, every 24 hours is pain, nothing but pain. It hurts to breathe. It hurts to sleep. It hurts to move from side to side. It hurts to eat. Yeah, I just, I pulled my back recently, maybe a couple of weeks ago in the gym doing deadlifts. And, you know, you, you forget how often you kind of tweak and twist your back just doing the most, you know, mundane of things. So I can only imagine what it must be like having been shot in the back, man. It continues to say, it says, your life and uh, not only just, so your life and not only, your life and not only just your life, your legs, something you need to move around and forward in life can be taken from you like this, he said, clicking his fingers. He says, stick together, make some money, make um, everything easier for our people out there, man, because there's so much time that's been wasted, he said. He said, how the shooting occur? He said, a police officer shot Mr. Blake while he was trying to arrest him as he tried to get into a car where his three children were seated. Mr. Blake was not armed when he was shot, but a knife was later found in the car by the investigator. Again, most of a crucial point there. So the videos of the shooting, which were uploaded online, sparked a series of protests in Kenosha, which turned violent at points. Two protesters were killed in widespread looting and vandalism. The 17 year has been charged for their deaths. So I don't know, man. It, just makes me, it really just makes me think like... What's going to happen to America if Trump wins? These guys are going to blow up because they're trying to, like, make heroes out of people who just don't need to be heroes, right? Fair enough, this guy suffered greatly and it was a really tra tragedy that he got shot in the back. But does he need to be given messages of support for Black Lives Matter um, protesters from his hospital bed? Like, really, when it's a situation that he kind of, um, he was maybe responsible for, um, you know, in some way, shape or form, by visiting i guess the mother of his children when he wasn't meant to and causing a ruckus so much so that she had to call the police i just don't think this is the i don't know man I, what kind of message are you sending out there um it just makes it easy for the people that are with trump to kind of you know double down on their side but i guess that's how all politics is isn't it really you're not ever trying to convince the other side to come on your side really you're just trying to maybe reassure your base that everything's okay and to get them out there to vote. I think so, right? I don't think most politicians go out there thinking, you know what, I'm gonna convert somebody from the other side to join my to join my group. It doesn't really happen or to wear my color tie. That's not really a situation. Usually just hope. Constantly getting in front of camera, you're gonna remind your base that you're still alive, you're still doing the damn thing, so they can come out and vote for you when that time arises. I would imagine so anyway. But yeah, like again, speedy recovery to the guy. Hope he gets well soon, all that malarkey. But the details of the story do matter, man. They really do. Du -du 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 -du. Next, I think we talk about something that I mentioned briefly the other day. But um, this six nine thing is weird, isn't it? Or it's just me. Don't get me wrong, the guy's a muppet, right? Um, just as a as a human or as a man, right? This this kind of idea that he's this narrative that he paints about, you know, oh, um, my former um gang member friends were extorting me, kidnapping me, they'd threatened to, you know, kill my mother, they um supposedly slept with my child's mother, all this sort of stuff. And that's why I decided to snitch on them. That narrative is running, you know, it completely, you just throw out the window because there's plenty of other people that he kind of um, essentially snitched on who had nothing to do with the kidnapping, nothing to do with the alleged um, sexual misadventure of his baby mother. And he just completely threw them all under the bus because, it, you know, from the looks of it, he just couldn't face the, 
he he couldn't face the he couldn't face having to be in prison for the amount of time that he was meant to be in, right? Which is I think was sixty forty to sixty years or something stupid like that. He just didn't want to do it, which is completely understandable. So he decided to flip. But this idea that he's painting that he's somehow this um, guy that's been wrong and he was just a little kid who kind of was steered in the wrong way is not the right narrative. But that being said, I find it odd how the industry has decided. Um, on its own merit or in its own way to sort of cancel him and not give him an opportunity to make the sales, I guess, that he wants to make because obviously he's obsessed with numbers in the same way that Nicki Minaj is because, you know, maybe for good reason, um, especially in Nicki Minaj's way, you kind of use the numbers in order to kind of leverage other deals you're getting. But for 6 9 obviously, to come out of prison and to do the numbers that he did previously, he got a number one record with Nicki, all this sort of good stuff. I guess on paper, it's, a, it's kind of a good... Um, it's good for him because it kind of lets him know that, hey, I'm still able to kind of succeed and thrive, even in spite of the industry kind of closing their doors on you. But it seems like that stuff has finally caught up with him. Um, supposedly, his projected sales, first week sales are like down to like 35,000 um, from like a, the highs of like 150. So that goes to show that, you know, when the industry decides they don't like you and they kind of deem you not to be somebody they want to push and promote, they can effectively cancel your career or basically um, only allow you to get so far, only allow you to get so big, only allow you to have so so many, fan, so many fans. It's a thing that they can do, which is really concerning. And it really kind of opens your eyes up to things that Wale spoke about ages ago when he was having his debates or his arguments or his record label, right? And his kind of idea that, oh, he's, you know, the impression that you kind of get from Wale is that he feels like he's he hasn't been, He's kind of been held back. He should be the same group as the Kendricks and the Coles and the Drakes, but just through, you know, um, neglect at labels and not being the priority has essentially resulted in him having to jump around from a couple of labels here and there. So I guess um, 6 9 spoke about the fact that he's kind of feeling the pressure or feeling the fact that the industry has essentially iced him out, which is, you know, I guess for the people that don't like him, it's sort of a funny thing to see him being so vulnerable, even though he might be joking and trolling in this video. But I do get the impression that it's, it's finally got to him, especially now he's been able to move around and he's not in his home anymore. He's not in house arrest. He's definitely seen that, you know, whatever, 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 whatever clout or whatever access he left behind when he went into prison, now that he's come out, those doors have all shut. Like, I mean, no one's answering his phone calls. And essentially, he's had to kind of go around and get the attention of YouTubers all over the place. I think he's on he's on Logan Paul, actually. Uh, he should be on Logan Paul soon. So he's essentially tapped into that market because that's the only people that will actually talk to him. But here's a video of him sort of explaining um, or basically, you know, detailing some of his grievances with the industry. I won't come in a bad mood. I'm going to keep it all the way above. Supposed to be in a good mood, but I'm in a bad mood. Album just dropped yesterday. I'm looking at all these DSPs. DSPs is Apple Music, Spotify. Yo, they it's they completely shutting us out. Like if we didn't drop an album, this is on every phone, and I thought I'm bugging, right? This is the main page. And shout out to these artists. This don't really got nothing to do with y'all. This is this is the platform. New, this is new music. Let me see it on your phone. It's the same shit. I am. So they act like go to new music. What is this? Spotify? Spotify this Apple? Apple Music. This Spotify? Yeah. This we not on there? We not nope. on any of it. So they act like we didn't drop not a no single album. thing. Zero. All I'm saying is y'all already took radio away from us. If y'all gonna cheat us, just give us a fair. I woke up in a so the, the 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 thing that's the, the the thing for me that's slightly annoying about this issue is that when does it end right if you're saying that you're not going to give six nine a chance because it's a snitch how far does that go do you do the same thing for a guy that run off on a plug do you do the same thing somebody that sells shitty drugs in the ends you do that same thing that somebody that hits women do you do the same thing to somebody that kills their homies kills their best friends like how far does that go somebody that scams an artist because there's loads of scammers, right? There's loads of people that have kind of lawyers that have hoodwinked artists and labels that have ripped people off. The people keep getting signed to artists that rip people off. They're still, they're still able to thrive and survive in the industry. So why is it now that they've decided that this kid is the one that they're going to annex out of the scene? Because in my opinion, personally, again, I'm not necessarily a fan of his anyway. His music is not really for me. I think the first album, was it Day 69? That was maybe his best body of work. And even that wasn't that great. Um, if anything, he suffered because he snitched on all the people that were basically providing the source for his songs or his music. We've now seen that without 
Um, without the Treyway guys, he doesn't have the same lev- the same cadence, the same melodic flow that he has in previous tracks, even some of the same oomph. It sort of gets lost because you know he's basically snitching everybody that he was gangbanging with back in the days, right? Or well, well, before he went into prison. So musically, he obviously isn't as good as he was prior. Maybe he never was good in the first place. That's an argument for another day. But to suggest that he's not selling well because his music isn't good is ridiculous because there's plenty of music out there on the charts that isn't objectively that great, that gets a push from the label, that gets you know put in rotation at radio stations, that get secured into playlist, and via just pure force and will and depending on the amount of money the label's willing to spend, the the album or the single whatever it may be can go you know it can go in absolute numbers so i find this really strange that they decided okay we're gonna do this to this guy and again it kind of should be a wake-up call to artists to be like hey um gatekeepers actually do exist so if you do want to thrive in industry as good as it can as as um as good as an idea as it can be to be viral and to kind of rub people up the wrong way and get everyone bad side don't do it don't take it too far because I think if Six Nine would have come out and been a bit, a bit more, um, you know, just a bit more mellow, I guess to have some sort of sympathy for the situation that he's in, and maybe empathize a little bit with the people that he snitched upon, and maybe you know, um, put out there that he kind of is trying to change his ways or something. I don't know something to kind of get back on the good graces of people. I think he would have gone a long way, not even with the fan base. I think more so with the industry. I think the moment he came out and essentially started to antagonize everybody. And you have to look at, you have to look at all these guys like Dirk and everybody he was kind of beefing with. Don't look at them just as rappers. Look at them as like entities and brands within themselves who have got money people who they kind of um, answer to or money people that basically, you know, um, supplement their lifestyle or or they've heavily invested in, they're going to be annoyed when their product or their brand is being messed with by some kid that just come out of prison for snitching. They're not going to have it. So it's no surprise that a few of the doors have been closed, you know, um, recently for him. But I just think it's very odd. I, I would just, I would much rather 6 ix music career fizzle out into irrelevance solely based on the fans just saying, you know what, we don't think you're good and just walking away. Then the industry deciding that they don't want him to be played on any of their platforms it's like or to be featured or to be pushed out there. That doesn't really make any sense. Um, especially the playlist stuff. Like that's really bizarre. Like I used to, so you're telling me if I go through rap cover your playlist, I'm not gonna find somebody that might have snitched on somebody. I'm not gonna find a woman beater. I'm not gonna find somebody that might have fucks around with kids. Are you are you real? Come on. But let me know what you think. Um, do you think it's justifiable for Six Nine to be completely blackballed from the industry? Um, do you think it's um a necessary punishment for the crime that he did, or do you just think this is plain old karma? Let me know in the lo- comments down below. What else we have here? Ah, oh, we have a really disturbing actually video, um, from No Jumper featuring three young ladies who were very expressive in their um, details of sexual encounters with athletes and rappers, better known as the, was it, is a FOT show or something, right, on No Jumper with Selena Power and her friend who was, uh, went viral, I guess, a few weeks back for saying that she essentially, you know, went, um, uh, what you call it? She, she enjoyed the company of six basketball players, let's just say that. <coughs> <coughs> so i guess on the latest episode they decided to invite one of chief keith's baby mothers to come down and essentially talk about her experiences and um yeah it was as bad as you kind of would imagine it to be so i'm gonna play a little bit of the clip for you now are they ready for this he said yeah yeah go baby what? you you can't you gotta oh, you can keep on. it oh! <laughs> okay, I will tell y'all the story. Oh, allegedly. 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 We're, we're allegedly. avoiding lawsuits here. Okay, mm-hmm. Allegedly. We're do- Jesus. Dodging. Okay. Yes, he loves Tell to be you. shitted on. You know, like, the internet is amazing in some respects, isn't it, right? Access to some, you know, the world's, you know, access to information at your fingertips. Never ending streams of entertainment. But then there's also this part where with social media, there's this kind of need to be viral, need to be seen, need to be heard and need to be in front of the cameras, you know, no pun intended. <coughs> also, irony notwithstanding. <coughs> 
And it gets to the point where you have these three young ladies who have their whole lives in front of them um, sitting on a show and, you know, detailing the most intimate, private um, sexual preferences of people they've been with in the past. And it's like, is this really what the internet is about? Is this really what we've kind of reduced to? Is this really what we kind of deem to be entertainment? Like, what is this? Like, honestly, what is this? Like, why do I know this? Why why should I know he's into one of... Again, This if this is BS, it's BS, right? No wonder, regardless. But this shouldn't even be a conversation. There should be some things that are just, like, sacrilege to kind of mention, right? Like, what's that saying about um, a gentleman never kisses and tells, right? Isn't there something similar for women? Don't they have a similar sort of code or something? I'm assuming in your own private friend groups or they're in their own private friends groups, of course, they're going to be sharing information and, you know, advising on who to kind of avoid in terms of danger and all that's malarkey. I understand. Or even just sharing good experiences they've had. But this? Really? <sighs> oh, okay. okay, that was my first time ever. I never you thought... did it? You actually no, did I, it? I actually couldn't shit. Okay, I couldn't <laughs> shit. Okay, I, couldn't I don't shit. think I could shit on the way I either. Could what shit. the fuck? I could not do it. it was, that was something like I'm a wild ass. I can yeah. do. I could do some freak ass whole mm -hmm. shit. You yeah. know what I'm saying? But the shit part, <laughs> you, you, you can't just shit. do that to me like on the spot. Like, like shit, shit on right me. Now. Jesus. And no offense to these young ladies too, but like, or oh, just a word to the men out there as well, man. Is this? Is this the best you could do, really, for real? This is. This is. And again. The, it's not even that. It doesn't even. Does it even matter? Is what well what they look like? It doesn't really, does it? It's just all nasty. It really is just complete nastiness. Like everyone here looks ugly just for the sake of just sitting around there giggling and kikiing about somebody's intimate sexual preferences that should be kept private and between two consenting adults. No one else should know about this. This is worse than kissing and telling. This is worse than that. This is like whatever kissing and telling is. This is like you know, five or 10 levels above it. It's just beyond measure, like how this can, and again, like, would you want, it would not what do you want to be known for this? Because what else are they known for? Do you know what I mean? It doesn't really matter in that respect, but God damn it, man. I, I can't even watch it myself. I'll move on. I'll put the link for you in the show notes for you guys to see, but it just, it's just, yeah, it's, it's too much. It's too much. I can't do this. I cannot watch this sort of stuff. Um, <laughs> moving on to other distressing news, especially for my interest, um, my guy Joe Budden is involved in some marital disagreements, it seems like, um, since Antenna has accused Joe Budden of getting physical with him in a leaked phone conversation and now court documents that is just, yeah, man, it seems like a bit, it's been a bad couple of weeks for Joe Budden, the Joe Budden show or Joe Budden, yeah, podcast. If you're not familiar, they had a show or podcast exclusively on Spotify that was due for renegotiation. Uh, but of course they couldn't come to any kind of resolution so they decided to amicably part ways of course in typical Joe Biden fashion it wasn't that amicable he kind of aired out his grievances with Spotify mentioned some stuff that was kind of justifiable and some stuff that I kind of didn't agree with but in the end they couldn't work out a deal that made sense for both parties so they parted ways no problem but since that it feels as if like and again, Joe's a bit of a conspiracy theorist, so maybe listening to this guy too much, you can kind of get sucked into his way of thinking. But having seen the issues or the things that have kind of transpired since this is kind of broken out, it kind of makes me believe that there is people, there is maybe some high ups orchestrating Joe Budden's downfall. Or maybe capitalizing on the fact that they see him and he's vulnerable in his position because he doesn't have the co-sign of Spotify next to him. But essentially what happened was that um, obviously he said what he said about Spotify, which then led to him having a back and forth with Charlemagne, which then led to um, his old Mrs. Um, what's her name? Ba, 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 Tahiri, Tahiri coming out, alleging that, that she, basically insinuating that Joe Budden broke her nose. And then now suddenly you have Sin Santana, who's the mother of his newborn child, coming out and essentially saying that she wants full custody of the kid because Joe's an absolute nutcase, according to the documents that she filed, right? Allegedly. Um, this is the, so this is the article here called uh, from what was that? Madame Madame Noir. So Sin Santana accuses Joe Budden of getting physical with her in a leaked phone conversation. 
It says, last week we told you that Tahiri shared what she'd been in an abusive relationship with Joe Budden and that he fractured her rib and pushed her down the stairs during heated uh, moments. He responded on her claims on his podcast by claiming she was actually abused him and they had a toxic relationship and saying that she is a cancerous, toxic, clout, check, clout and check chasing liar. Bloody hell, man playing out all this in public is just oh yeah yeah as we previously stated um she isn't the first woman budden has been involved with to claim that the rapper and podcaster was abusive it now seems like she won't be the last it's unclear how the audio leaked but a conversation between budden and his former fiance since santana was recently released it seems to be from the right it seems to be from uh, right after the breakup and two months before they started filming their late season Love and Hip Hop New York. The former couple are having a really hard time on the call with coming uh, to an agreement about how to best co-parent their son Lexington. It is their first time talking in a while. She asked him to not reach out to her for a while and he said he was trying to give her time but admitted sin. I'm really trying not to be that guy to just start stalking you and just popping up so we can have a face-to-face -face conversation. Um, and he continues as she says she needs him to respect her space and focus on what's important. What is important is that she says she needs him to help provide a home for their son because she claims that he kicked her out and their son out of his home and hadn't been helped and hadn't helped her financially. She also said um, she's not comfortable with him caring for her son alone because of his busy schedule, not knowing the needs of their son, who is a baby at the time and allegedly drinking habits. Um, he reiterates that he isn't trying to meet up with her to have a healthy he, he, he what he's trying to have a healthy face-to-face -face conversation sorry so they can hash out their differences but she won't allow it in response to that she says she doesn't want to meet him because he's allegedly chased and dragged her which i guess sparks the whole entire backlash on it right and it's a difficult one isn't it because i think the issue obviously is especially with joe is that if you listen to the podcast you know how hard he is on people that have been accused and you know on hitting women and he's been involved in a few relationships that you know of course they're toxic and it takes two people to create a toxic relationship but there are too many occasions where joe's been involved in women and it's kind of resulted in some sort of physical altercation there's been too many instances of um those kind of things you know for people to kind of look him and give him a bit of the side eye especially when you consider their stance that they took on you know tory lanes and stuff like that right it kind of makes it odd you know to take that kind of stance when you've got these sort of skeletons that you're kind of dealing with in your own regard and then the other side of it i guess in in terms of leaking the phone call it can only come from one place because it sounds like you know it was sim that was recording it you can question why that's happened i think as a fan of the podcast it's odd because i think just a couple of weeks ago joe was sort of like talk, talking quite glowingly about sin how they kind of had mended their relationship somewhat and that they were kind of co-parenting in a good and harmonious way and then suddenly now it feels as if like she's done a completely 360 and sort of like she's doing everything she can to kind of you know muddy his name so that she can claim full custody of the kid so i guess in some respects if you're joe you can't take that leaked document too personally because she needs to do what she needs to do as a mother to kind of get custody of the child so she needs to kind of draw in a memory bank and pull out any occasion or any memory that she has of you being an unfit father just so she can paint herself in a good light it's neither good or bad it's neither here or there it is what it is um i guess the issue for joe is that without the big corporate backing how can you i guess maybe there's an argument to say that if you have, don't have the corporate backing you can maybe sus sustain this assault on you better than if you had the corporate backing but some of it's making me feel as if like i don't know man is this podcast going to survive this stuff like these are some very serious allegations especially considering the women that are saying these things are not flings they're not people that he met in a start in a nightclub or something or a strip club right these are women that he was kind of friends with like even in the document i think it alleges that or she says actually since says, um she met joe when she was 17 and he was like 25 or something so they know each other for years right so it's not like these are just some fly-by-night women who are trying to essentially extort him or get some money out of his pocket or basically extort him or use you know use this opportunity to get more clout these are women who have kind of you know dated this guy for a long time know how he is as a person and are now alleging these really really bad things against him and it just seems like considering you know and then the, again the story about him and his dog as well is going viral online it's just a complete horror show of a situation man it really is um you'd you, you'd love there to be some lessons to be learned from this but i just don't think that's the case i think he's just gonna have to just ride this one out the way it is and just hope for the best um hope to come out the other side a far better person whether or not that happens or not who knows but yeah it's just a shame to see joe Biden go through this man
um, just as a fan of the show in general. Again, if he's done what he's done, then, you know, he doesn't have anyone to blame else but himself. But, you know, God almighty, man. Imagine playing all this baby mama drama in... And this is real baby mama drama. This isn't like, you know, he, did, he didn't buy me a handbag or he didn't get me a car. This is like some real shit. Real, real shit. It's funny, though. I think in the court document, they said that supposedly he's on Molly every day. <laughs> that's a mad drug to take daily you know maybe it's an american thing because i think they have it differently right you think americans put it in like capsules and shit and mix it with sugar and all that malarkey um they're a bit odd with that stuff right because those kids that go to like those edm raves are on it like all night long in it and in most civilized places it's usually a thing that you take to kind of give you a pep to sort of you know give you a bit of a boost when your energies are running a bit low but to be on it daily right to be like sucking them sucking on a, on a capsule like it's a tic tac is odd um maybe it's a natural reaction to somebody that's a bit is that a thing if you're depressed would you take molly i don't think that's true right or if you have some sort of mm, i'm not too sure maybe depressed is not the right one maybe whatever it is i i wonder if it helps in terms of clearing the mind or allowing you just to feel a little bit of happiness for a short period in your for a short period in your day right maybe that's the kind of thing but i thought that was odd um obviously the touching up with the kid uh, sorry touching up with the dog she alleged that he um kisses their son on the mouth <laughs> which is an issue just some things that you should never know again it goes back to the older beckham thing it's like the stuff that i shouldn't know about people that i kind of look up to or people that i kind of i'm a fan of i shouldn't know these intimate details about them it's just too much you know what i mean but i guess you know they're both public figures and they have to kind of work it out in the best way possible it's best for them um and yeah man it's gonna be a messy one it feels like i don't think there's gonna be any way that they could amicably sort this in any real good way like the solution of course is that they both kind of you know become adults and decide that hey there's a there's a little kid at, at stake here that's far more important than than the sum of our individual parts um we're stronger together as a family but i think that think that um that car has long long or that horse has long bolted mate long long bolted but hey what can you do next we have what else we want to talk about should not talk about that one not really not really who else we thought was interesting oh yeah let's talk about this this is quite cool so do, 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 do. no let's talk about this actually this is funny here yeah, it's update do you remember i told you um that um i shared the news that supposedly joe rogan's podcast was being censored by spotify so when obviously joe rogan made the switch to spotify a few episodes went awry and they happened to all be the ones that are concerning you know people with uh dicey online online reputations the owen benjamins the milos the alex joneses those podcasts were sort of essentially omitted from the export from apple or from youtube or across to spotify and then Joe came out, I think, or somebody suggested the fact that, oh, it happened because of the migration issues. And then I guess Joe Rogan clarified this exact, or what exactly occurred via Alex Jones, but I'm still not sold on it. I still don't think this is entirely true, but let's hear what Joe Rogan told Alex Jones what the issue was. First off, I've been mobbed by people the last three months on the street, calling my phone, sending emails saying, has Joe Rogan really moved to Austin or is he moving to Austin? I will answer that question in just a moment. But first off, had a lengthy discussion with Joe this morning, just a few minutes ago, because I had to call him in the middle of the night, buzz, buzz, call, call. I get up at like 5 a.m., dozens of text messages and calls saying, is Spotify censoring the Joe Rogan podcast? And I didn't know until I talked to him this morning and he explained it. They've got 1,500 plus files and then some migrating over and they've had a few problems here and there with corrupted files with the naming of them and spotify wants to have a first rollout then a second rollout and here's the key joe rogan's favorite 100 episodes of the last 10 years or so will be left on youtube starting december 31st when he goes exclusively to spotify for this couple month no man's land mm, who knows the content will be on both platforms and will be migrating over the interesting part of it is that this is not Joe Rogan explaining this. This is like Joe Rogan explaining this via the medium of Alex Jones, which is interesting. I don't really know why just Joe doesn't come out and explain what the issue is, because I guess for some people out there, the issue of censorship is really important. And seeing a cha seeing a platform like Joe and seeing somebody like Joe Rogan who kind of rags on censorship and 
It's always going on and on about it on his own show to suddenly kind of buckle to the pressure of Spotify to not get these shows on there. You know, it's concerning, but I don't know. I'm an adult, isn't it? I also realized that he signed a hundred million dollar deal, supposedly, right? Or if you believe some of the reports, it's probably more than that. Um, compromises needed to be made, right? Some adjustments might have been done. Um, and if he has to remove 10 to 15 or 20 podcasts on his show, in order for him to keep that check, in order for him to keep doing what he loves, it is what it is, isn't it? I, I think, unfortunately, like, he's a grown man. Like, you know, he's free to do exactly what he wants with his own platform. He doesn't even probably owe us an explanation, really. He can just continue doing what he's doing. But I think, considering how strongly held opinions he has regarding censorship, he probably should explain it in some way, shape, or form. Because I think, you know, saying this through Alex Jones to kind of maybe appease Alex Jones is not really the best way to kind of go about things, in my opinion. But I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think Joe Rogan's actually being legit with Alex about this issue? Or do you think it's just the fact that, you know, the people that he admitted are problematic and he has to kind of make a decision on who he picks, isn't it? And this is the horse he's picking is Spotify. Let me know in the comments below. Next, we've got a uh, pretty cool article from Resident Advisor um, featuring uh, Sebastian Voigt, a booker from else in Berlin. They're one of the only, they're one of the, they're one of a few open air clubs that are open now in Berlin. Um, of course, other places in Europe are, have got their nightclubs open and they're sort of raving up and doing, you know, doing whatever they can do. But most places are only allowing people to gather in place um, in open air spaces. But, you know, there's not a lot of places that have open air bars and, they're, you know, there's a particular way that they work. Um, and it's hard to maybe maintain them, especially during these COVID times or to make them successful in any way, shape or form. But from the outside looking in, I found the else parties to look pretty cool in terms of how they handle it and how they basically enforce the rules. And if you look at some of these videos that I found in this um, Instagram page, um, there is a lot of indication that they really do go above and beyond to make sure that it's a good experience for everybody in there. For the most part, everyone's wearing a mask um, on the dance floor. They supposedly have rangers that patrol the dance floor in order to make sure people are complying with that. There's sanitizers all over the place and all this sort of good stuff. And in general, it feels like a really good vibe. And the benefit, I think, with having a kind of open air uh, club in Berlin and doing and kind of abiding by the COVID laws as strict as well as they are, is that you then invite some of the best ravers or you then you then you then provide a platform for some of the best ravers in the world to really come out and enjoy themselves. And there's no denying that, regardless if you want to get into Bergheim or not, there's no denying that Berlin does kind of have the best kind of scene in terms of people that actually go out to enjoy music, to dance, to rave. Especially if it's a this is a huge contrast to the videos that you'll see of people dancing at you know on the pages such as um, business techno pages, right? Of those DJs, like this is way way different. So I'm going to play the clip for you now. So if you're listening with headphones or anything, make sure you lower that volume before I play this. And it looks pretty fun to me. Everyone's packed in. But the fact that it's outdoors doesn't really matter because for the most part, most of the information out there concerning COVID says it spreads exponentially more so indoors as opposed to outdoors and if long as everyone's making around a mask and you know making sure they're doing all the right sensible things you should be fine this goes back to that um outbreak in south korea in this in the starbucks in south korea remember that story where supposedly a lady who was asymptomatic had covid was sitting in a starbucks in south korea and she was sitting right underneath a air conditioner but she had no idea of course she had no idea she had covid asymptomatic mm -hmm. and she spread it into the, the entire starbucks and everyone basically got it except for the four staff members that were working at starbucks because they were wearing their mask the entire time i guess the other patrons were kept kept taking it on and off again whilst they were eating and drinking and shit or just probably forgetting to put it back on whilst they took it off after eating so as long as you've got a mask on i'd imagine um, it could be fairly safe, um, especially if they're kind of enforcing the rules and abiding by the track and trace and all that sort of stuff. That's another video. And it looks so fun, man. Absolute miss raving so much. It's Ricardo Real Lobos playing. Look how fun that looks. And another video too, Ricardo. And I guess to end it, 
Sebastian Voigt, the booker for this club, else had a really good sit down with um, resident advisor where he essentially broke down exactly what they're doing in terms of making it work. And I'm going to read a little bit of it for you now here. Ba, 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 ba. So it says here, um, can you paint a picture for me of yesterday's party? Every time I've seen Ricardo Villalobos in Berlin, it's a bit of madness, totally packed. It's hard for me to picture a COVID era version of that. He said, sure. It's it, it's like any other party where limited is capacity now and everybody has to wear a mask at all times, at least while they're on the dance floor and while they're make, walking around. They can take them off when they're sitting. It's the same as in the restaurants here. When you're walking around, you wear the mask and at a table, you take it off, which is a pretty decent rule easy to abide by very clear instructions um you know it, it, we shouldn't be surprised in the germans right they're bloody efficient they get the job done so it says yeah for, for the longest time we were um, really hesitant to reopen others were already already doing it and we weren't sure if we should do it as well i personally had a lot of concerns about it but we decided to give it a go and it went really well for the first time onwards i was um, pleasantly surprised that people are complying wearing a mask and also dancing their asses off everybody needs it the artists the crowds everybody is keen to go out and have a dance if this is the, if that's the choice that you'd either wear a mask and you can go out or you can stay at home and watch djs on the stream then well that's what it is and by now people are so used to wearing masks all the time that it's kind of okay which is very true and something i've kind of been reconciling myself to in the beginning you know when everything was happening and you know we were, we were thinking that if you go outside and you coughed on somebody you might kill someone's grandma yeah you know it, emotions were raw and you're like you know what people shouldn't be partying at all but then the more time you spend at home and the more time you're reading and kind of educating yourself on the issue and finding out that you know it probably isn't as bad as they're making it out or if it is as bad as they're making it out there are precautions that could be had in order to kind of restart the economy open things up in a really safe way it kind of makes you think that, hey, why don't they allow some places to open that have the possibility to be open there to kind of put some money in the in the, in the till to support the staff members and kind of boost the local economy in some way, shape or form and give people a bit of respite, a little bit of enjoyment, something to kind of look forward to. Because if you're telling me I have, I have to look forward to going to a park and playing music on my Bluetooth speaker or, you know, watching another DJ stream online and pretending that I'm in a club when I'm really not. I'm going to lose my mind. So providing that platform for people, providing that escape for people is really cool, especially in a safe way. I really love it. it says here, um, normally we have a small indoor area, but that's closed. You said we are, so we are totally, completely open air. Um, plus the mask, make it pretty safe. As long as people are wearing a mask, there doesn't need to be distancing in place. People can dance like normal on the dance floor, the same way they sit with each other on the S-Ban or stand next to each other on the supermarket. Exactly. And I wish that was more of a thing going forward um in this is the kind of and again it said um so another question here to kind of relay it out it said aside from the mask and limited capacity what changes have you made to comply with the hygiene regulations you said there's a few we have this whole list of hygiene rules that we have in place you have to register when you get in scan this qr code on the door and fill out a form with your name address name contact details it sends you an email you have to show at the door to get in so you can't give fake name or fake email addresses that's fairly quick and easy when you get in obviously masks are required and hand sanitizers everywhere and we have a team of rangers on awareness um team that will walk around and venue and constantly remind people to leave their mask on which is amazing right how how um how uh how much peace of mind would that give you that'll give you all the peace of mind because i think it's part of me to be like you know what i'd love to go but also be nervous but knowing how far they are with everything i'd be willing to kind of take my top off and have a little dance rather sooner than later it continues so it's still a learning curve this is our third weekend we when we started actually you published this re review and observed that while it worked pretty well later in the day people get more loose and more drunk and high maybe the mask are up up and not up all the time we realized that in the beginning we had two rangers now we have four constantly patrolling making sure people are complying and it works well i think that would work well in this in the uk because we have too many security guards on the dance floor anyway sometimes and they're really aggressive and they have bright yellow jackets on jeremy it's just a bit excessive so if you could kind of adapt their role to be the mask enforcers on the dance floor i think it worked pretty well uh, we continue to said yesterday i was there as you say ricardo and his crew they were a perfect example of a loose and wild but it was fine there was always some people you have to remind again and again but 96 percent, 98 percent of the people are doing it really well and i think we had one or two weeks ago where we had the security because somebody would refuse to put a mask on he was wasted and got a bit weird but security had a long chat with him and then he agreed but then the other telling part of it as well it says here where is it next 
Uh, yeah, what does it say? Is it next year? What does it say? What does it say? Uh, yeah, it come. It makes a very good obse- uh, kind of starting observation that got me a bit worried. Um, yeah, this is it. Indoor raving isn't coming back this year. Not before summer, probably. Unless next month there's a surprise vaccine, which of course is the chances are not high. So probably this will be the only thing people can do. Maybe until next summer. Maybe there will be others like us. I don't know what the other open airs are planning to do. When winter comes, I'm sure people will have no problem dancing in the cold. That is really concerning because I think if you're looking forward to going to a club, that's essentially written off for you. I think we've kind of all come to that conclusion. But it's also maybe a good indication as to why a lot of these bigger festivals uh, postponed their events instead of cancelling them and kind of pushed them back to 2021 because, of course, you know, we know that, you know, COVID doesn't really um, spread that quickly in the sun or outdoors. So you could effectively put on a full scale festival performance, right? Show thing with no hassle, with no trouble, with no kind of limited seating, no limited ticketing at all um, next year and be completely fine, even if we didn't have a vaccine by then. Of course, you're giving yourself the most, you know, you're giving yourself a head start, a bit of time, a bit of buffer, but you could effectively get away with that really, really easily. Um, but again, uh, that's something to get, definitely keep in the back of your head in it, that raves are not going to, indoor raves in any way, like the ability to go to Berghain or to go to Grease Mueller, the new venue, or to go to Fold here in the UK, that won't be around for a while. Sub club, you know, up in Scotland, wherever it may be. Um, yeah, that's the concerning part. But I recommend you check out the whole interview, man. It's a really, really cool one. Again, uh, check out as well this um, Instagram page. I think that's posting a few clips as well regarding some of the raves. It looks really, really fun. I actually want to go there, to be honest. It looks like a good time. Look at that. God damn it, man. I want to rave so badly. And see the difference of the crowd? Look how hard they're dancing. Look at them, look at them going for it. It's the complete opposite of the, of the Italian crowd you see, you know, going to watch your favorite business techno person playing. They're just letting loose, enjoying themselves, raving, masks on, doing a damn thing. Love it. Absolutely love it. I can't wait to be back in Berlin. I really cannot. But hey, until then, we stay in London. Anyway, that's been the Axiom Zing Show, episode number 370. Thanks so much for tuning in as per usual. If it's your first time watching the show, make sure you smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review and share the show with your friends. And if you want to support the show via Patreon, the link is in the show notes description. It's patreon.com for slash Agostino. Support the show for as little as $1. You get access to my entire audio library, as well as this podcast in full audio format before anybody else gets it. So make sure you check that out. Until next time, people, see you soon. Peace.